Good evening, everybody. Welcome to June's uh, boom time. Literally, uh, June's boom time as well today, because I am so happy to welcome the incredible and inspirational June Sarpong Ooh. to the studio this evening. And we're going to be talking about the future of diversity and some of the great work that June is doing uh, in shaping mm. the future of that and the roles that she's doing and the books that she's written and her life in general. Yes. Um, before we start that, we just have to do our little introduction to the session. And um, you know that what we do in this session is we always think about how do we unblock, unlock and unleash that future that we want all of you to have and we want all of you to share in. So hopefully tonight you'll pick up loads of great insights from June and from the conversation. And if you miss them, we will also provide, as we always do every month, a boom sheet with all of those really clear things for you to take away and use in your everyday life to help you create the future that you want to see. Nice. That's what we do, June. That's what we do. <laughs> now, for those who don't know June, and I'm sure everyone in the audience does, and of course most of you at home uh, do two too. People uh, two people. people. We've, we're we've, going to have to get your names, two people. <laughs> we will, we will. We've broken the COVID barrier at last. We've got a fourth wall to look at. Um, but I know there's loads of you tuned in at home, online, uh, and you all know who Jean is. If you don't know who she is, which I'm very, be very amazed, didn't, but I'll give you a very short history of a career spanning over 20 years in media. Goodness. She's become one of the most recognisable faces in British television, as well as being one of the UK's most intelligent and dynamic hosts. June is one of the only hosts of her generation that is equally comfortable uh, at interviewing politicians, celebrities and members of the public. In October, June... In uh, October 2019, June made history to become the first ever Director of Creative Diversity at the BBC, where, as part of her role, she developed strategies to support both on-air and production talent representation and portrayal across the BBC, its platforms and its partners, mm. to make the BBC more inclusive and representative of the bro a broad and di diverse audience it serves. Please welcome, this evening... Special guest, June Sarpong. Aww. Welcome, everybody. A little round of applause. Aww. People clapping at home. Thank you very much. Hello, Scott. Hi, June. Welcome. How are you? Nice to be here with you. And, and nice to be able to actually do this in person. Yeah. And, and we were talking off camera. I have a cold, everyone, so forgive me. <laughs> it's a cold, not COVID. I'm just being clear on that. So um, I might be sneezing and blowing my nose. As long through. as you've got a tissue, we don't need... I have lots got of tissue. tissue. Got your tissue, you're all okay. I'm good. Um, Jean, I wonder if we could start with I don't know, I don't know, a big, meaty question to start everything yeah. with. But what was your experience of race, diversity and inclusion growing up? And what yeah. kind of experiences? Yeah, really that? good question. So I was lucky. Um, I grew up in East London, very multicultural East London, in Walthamstow, or yeah. Walthamstow as it's better known as. <laughs> um, and I grew up at a time when uh, there was a sort of influx of immigrant families like myself, um, but you still had a very um, sizable um, uh, portion of the original white working class community but the area was also becoming gentrified, so you had a lot of middle-class people moving in. So we had this amazing melting pot. And my family are from Ghana, and there was a big Ghanaian community. Um, so I never felt like I was the only one. You know, there were lots of people like me. And also, you know, diversity was celebrated in my area. Um, um, and my family are very uh, proud Africans, so it was instilled in me this sort of sense of pride and of, in our culture and our heritage. Mm. So I think that I'm, without that strong foundation, I'd be a very different person. I think if I'd grown up in an area where I was the only black person as a kid, that would have been very tough. That was not my experience. So when that became my experience in the workplace, yeah. I had a very strong foundation and I handled it differently in the sense that for me, I led with my point of difference and felt that that was my contribution at a time where, you know, a lot of people of colour were made to feel as if they had to hide and suppress that part of themselves. Unlike now, we're having these conversations. Certainly when you and I were starting, we were not having those conversations. No. But I think my sort of early life prepared me to be willing to have those conversations, even at a time when people weren't open to having them. 
Yeah. That's, yeah, that's a, I like the last point you make there about, mm. you know, the willingness to have the conversations back then. Even yeah, old, very different back then, you know, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I grew up as um, my mum and my father got together. Mm. My mum's from Jamaica, mm. my dad was English. Mm. And we went to live in a little village in the 70s. And, and I always talk about this weird situation where we were like a mixed race family yeah. in a completely white world. Yeah. And people didn't really know what, what to, to do. do. With you. <laughs> didn't know how, what to ask. And I've got this wonderful um, photograph. We were in the local paper. My mum rode a tricycle, and so there's my mum and my sister and me on this tricycle, and they thought she was some sort of exotic. It was some sort of exotic thing that she rode this tricycle. It was like, well, no, actually, I just ride it because it's the only. Way I Look get at the my kids two to kids school. to school. <laughs> um, but it, but it, it's interesting you say about. And it was out of London. I oh, it was well out of London. London. We were in the north of England. experience as well, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I actually, even now, where my mum lives, you know, there's, there's more multiculturalism, but it's, it's still yeah. very, very few and far between yeah, those areas. Of course. But that idea of having those conversations and, and opening up those conversations yeah. is really important in the work that you're doing, yeah. obviously, right now. How do you go about opening those conversations up? What well, I think, think the lucky thing now is people at least are open to it even if they're uncomfortable having them and and so I think we're in a much better position and place now to address these issues than perhaps we've ever been um, I think the first thing really is to um, depend on depending on who you are in in the dynamic so whether you're somebody from an underrepresented group or you're somebody from a majority group wanting to be an ally um, I think the most important thing for underrepresented people is to find allies yeah. and to make sure that a safe space is created for you because you know if you're sharing you know a lot of this stuff is not comfortable um uh, it's, it's not it's not necessarily you know you don't want to relive many of these sort of microaggressions and slights and mm. the things that people from diverse backgrounds have to put up with. So making sure that one, it, the space itself is comfortable and safe for you to share. Um, and then on the other side, the same. Um, and what I always say to those that are from sort of um, the mainstream is to be willing to listen and be open to the fact that maybe on this issue you don't know. It's not your experience. <laughs> so actually sit back and let someone whose experience it is um, explain and, and tell you. Um, and then, once that's happened, there's a sort of trust that's built to be able to then start looking at solutions. It's um, one of the greatest bits of advice that was actually given to me was, was uh, amongst other things, but learn to say, I don't know more. Yeah. <laughs> because How about that? Just because saying it just puts you in a sense of, well, I want to learn from Yeah. Learn and, from and why would you know? Yeah. We were talking earlier, actually, about a book that's in the pipeline. We're going to talk about your new book in a second. Yeah. I want to talk about a book that's in the pipeline. Yes. Definitely <laughs> uh, in the pipeline. Definitely in the pipeline. <laughs> and and it's, it's called The Only One in the Room. Right? Yeah. The, the, the thing. And, I, and I just thought I would just draw a little bit on it because it kind of ties in what you're saying. Mm. This feeling for, you know... The a other. Lot of the, yeah, he's like... When you are the other. The, the other in the room. And, yeah. and it could be whether your skin colour, whether your gender, whether your sexual orientation, it could be anything. Or a mixture of a mixture. many, <laughs> which, which I tend to fall into. Yeah. yeah. So it's like... Yeah. Working class, you know, yeah. black woman. Yeah. I was once uh, disabled for a short period of time. Um, so, yeah, definitely. So all these, all these things... that. They're, they're going to be a kind of a theme for mm. your book, which yeah. I, mean, I know you're going to be right. Mm. Um, but it is a topic that's, that I've heard a few people talking about. It's starting to get a bit of traction. Yeah. And a couple of people I know have written about it. And yeah. But, yeah, what does that, for, for people who haven't experienced it, because I think it's important to hear, what well, does I it think, feel like? I think for people who haven't experienced it, I think it's important that they experience it. So, you know, one of the things that I do with leaders is sort of outside-the-box training where we put them in environments where they are the only one mm. in the room. And they're not the only one in the room from a position of power as well, because sometimes a power dynamic can totally flip things on its head. Even if you're the only one, if you're the one that has the power, it's still not the same, is yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. So putting enough. them in environments where they are the minority 
and letting them try that on for size, even if it's just for a couple of hours, and the discomfort of that, yeah. and imagining that that is what your diverse colleagues are dealing with day in, day out yeah. in your workplace, and are you addressing that? So, um, yeah, so I think the most important thing for anyone who wants to know what it can possibly feel like is rather than going to people who experience it and asking them is actually you try it on for yourself because there are opportunities to be the only one in the room but often when you live in a world that's designed in your image you don't have to experience that unless you seek it and i think that you should be curious enough to seek it if you really want to get it right on inclusion i think it's yeah a, a friend of mine does this really um he set out to, to feel exactly what Good. you experience. And he's created something he's called Daniel Fiendarka, mm. brilliant guy, uh, created something called The Token Man. Good for him. And so he yeah, said, but he's probably enjoying that, though, isn't no, he? He's not, token no, man. It's, no <laughs> it's like, great. <laughs> <right. laughs> <laughs> no, but the interesting thing is, it's not just him doing it, but it's like he's, he's saying to men, go into a room full of powerful women yeah. and be the only man in the room yeah. and see how it feels yeah get that level of discomfort yeah I think. so encouraging more people to do that good is um definitely important nice. i mean i read in a guardian article so i like to do my reading mm. <laughs> but you were quoted as saying that you don't have the luxury no. of being mediocre no i don't <laughs> <laughs> so, so i, I we haven't got to that place yet <laughs> <laughs> one day please <laughs> in my lifetime <laughs> I don't think you could ever be mediocre. Well, I'm going to try. In your, it's not in your, uh, in your nature. <laughs> but, I mean, I took that phrase, I'm, I'm the article, that, but I took that phrase as that kind of, the, the thing that I was always told, actually. Yeah, twice as good, yeah, for half you, as much. Exactly. Yeah. You know, you've always got to do the extra little bit yeah. more to get that little bit less. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. But I, I did certainly feel that early in my career. But as I've sort of gone through it... Um, but do you think that's still true? Mm -hmm. do you think, are we seeing any shift? Yeah, I think it's still true. If we're just looking at data in terms of the na number of leaders that there are from ethnic backgrounds yeah. um, and the number of people in senior, even mid-level actually, still not what it should be. So I think the data is quite clear mm. that that is still the case. Yeah. Yeah. I just... Um, it just strikes me that I don't know how to try and break that. That that even because I, I don't know how much of it is it how much of it is mindset and how much of it is it, is it reality. Because because there's another part of me that says people you know there are loads of good people out there who are doing great stuff. Who if you give them the right mindset, they do great they do great things without having to have that kind of sense of feeling like. Or I've got to work twice as hard or whatever. And so I don't know how much of it is mindset yeah, and reality. Yeah, but I think, I, think, I think the way, I suppose the way to assess it is I, extreme levels of success. Because I think, I think with these things, it's always interesting when you look at the outliers. So who are the people that have defied the odds mm. in any group? And often, if you look at that so you look at a set of circumstances that you know are sort of like for like as it were and then you look at the outcomes at some point mm. you see where systems kick in that made one person's success much more likely than mm. another's even when we're looking at ability being the same right. and so I think that that is what tells us that there are still systems in place that mean that if you are from a certain background, you are a certain gender, um, age is still a big one in our, in our society, that you're more likely to progress. And I think that we can't shy away from that. And, and the good thing with inequality is it shows you what works and what doesn't work. So you can do more of what works for those from diverse backgrounds. Um, I want to talk a, bit, a little bit about your kind of success. Yeah. And I think we were talking earlier. And I was, you know, Sorry. When I, go ahead. Um, Cold, not COVID. <laughs> you've certainly sort of definitely been a trailblazer. You know, I think you've, you've 
done some incredible stuff. And I just think even like, <laughs> embarrassing, but, you know, but just even recently, like, you've never shied away from doing big interviews like <laughs> you know, Obama and Marcus Rashford and yeah. done Nelson Mandela and all those kind of things. Um, they're kind of like huge things to take on and, and to do. Um, but I'm just quite curious for the audience. Well, like, how do you, when you're going about doing those things, like, how do you <laughs> get, you know, well, just how do you deal with it and how do you cope with them? What, what helps you go through those yeah. moments? Well, I think I really like people. That helps. Yeah, you, um, you do ask loads of questions yeah, just off camera, which yeah, I really love. Well, I, you, I find people's life stories, yeah, fascinating. So I think that helps when you like people. Therefore, whoever the person is, you know, whether it is a Barack Obama or a Marcus Rashford or the bus driver, I'm curious about their life. Mm. Um, and I think that that, I hope, comes across, which then means people are comfortable with you and therefore they're going to open up, whoever they are, whether they are, you know, people that everyone else knows or someone completely, you know, obscure. So, yeah. Tell me what it was like with... Barack Obama and Marcus Rashford, because two people from kind of like yeah. really, I mean, doing great things, but from completely different backgrounds. Yeah, I think the thing that was so lovely to experience um, was how excited they were to meet each other. <laughs> yeah. That was what I loved about it. You know, off camera, they were both really giddy in, the, in a funny way, because I suppose for President Obama, in a way, I suppose he sees some of himself in Marcus, mm. in a, you know, a young Marcus Rashford. And Marcus, in a way, sort of obviously looks at Barack, President Obama as, you know, a sort of role model, if not even father figure. So it was just lovely to have that moment between them and, and, and just to be able to witness that before we actually started the proper interview. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, you're also... A prolific author. I'm going to say prolific author. <laughs> <laughs> Four books is pretty, you know. Three. Three and the fourth four one that, you, that we've had a little sneak into. Yeah, fourth one. About. <laughs> uh, My publishers are going to be like pulling their hair out. Yeah, literally, you're going to be on the phone after this going, <laughs> oh, God, how are you going with that next one? Um, the new book. And, the, and two of them are very little. That's a little advice to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> like, my first one was like this big book. Oh, I was like, why? Yeah. <laughs> Little pocket one's great. That's, that's what works really <laughs> well. But they are, actually, what, what I do like about your books is that they feel like, when you have know, read them and looked through them, they feel like a bit of a playbook more, mm, and like yes. really, really interesting and very practical. Very practical, stuff. yeah. Yeah, there's not, there's, it's not theoretical. No. There's obviously, there's obviously stuff behind it. One of the things I really loved, actually, and you were on a talk that I was, doing a little while ago we we're talking about diversify actually mm. but the, the whole point of the the, the thing that i love the most is this idea of the world is separate enough yes six um, degrees of integration, six degrees of integration yeah. is the way forward can you just tell, tell us a little bit about that thing because i just think in a world where we everyone feels at the moment so yeah i think it does drive this lack of thinking about diversif it does. diversity and inclusion it's also the fact that we even use um uh, separation to describe connectedness is an oxymoron in <laughs> yeah. itself, isn't yeah, yeah, it? It's yeah, bonkers. You're right. yeah. um, that kind of shows you where our default position is. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, there's six simple steps on how you can better connect with the other, whatever the other is for you. So, one is to challenge your ism, so whatever your unconscious bias is. Two, I think is really important, which is to check your circle in terms of how diverse your own social group is. Three, if it's not as diverse as you would like to create a connection. Four is to change your mind. Five is to celebrate difference. Because I think in the UK, sometimes we're uncomfortable acknowledging that we are different. And you yeah. know what? That's often where the magic happens. And then the six is to champion the cause, tell other people. And so everyone can get involved. Yeah. With I would definitely recommend getting that. Yeah, book. can we find out your names, two people? Yes, yeah, tell us your names. Uh, Four. Manuela. Manuela. Okay, nice to meet you. Arkin. 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 Oh, nice lovely. to meet you both. Thank you for joining us. Yeah. <laughs> we'll if you, have to get them on. <laughs> <laughs> bring some chairs around here. Chairs. <laughs> Join us on the stage. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have any questions while we're yeah. 
because we, we open up, <laughs> do we open, always open up to the audience. Can, can we, can we have hear, mics? is there a mic? Yeah. Let's get them One in this conversation, yeah. Yeah. now we've got to two people. Yeah, Arkans already, we know you've got a big <laughs> yeah, voice already because we heard you earlier. No, <laughs> you've got some questions. Yeah. Oh, and, and Katrina, Katrina as well has a question Founder in the back as well. Yeah, yeah look yeah. at that. Co-founder. Founder, founder. <laughs> <laughs> Don't even know who the other guy is. <laughs> <laughs> Manuela? Yeah, uh, so I do have a few questions, but I'll just start with this one. Because yes. I read your book, Diversify. Oh, sorry. Yes. I read your book, Diversify, which I thought was really, really good. Thank you. And most recently in the news especially, there's been um, a, lot of um, a lot of talk about um, how the white working class has been failed by the, by the country, by the government, and the, and the term white, um, white privilege has been blamed as for the reason. And my thoughts are, what are your thoughts on this? Um, what, how do you feel about it since you wrote a book you know, so much dedicated to this topic? Yeah, of course. Um, well, the, the, th the first thing is, obviously, we can't, um, in the same way we say uh, being black or being of eth whatever ethnic group you're from is not a monolith, being white is not a monolith either. And the experience of white people is not the same for all white people. Of course it isn't. Um, and, and in Diversify, I look at, um, in particular, the plight of white working class boys, uh, which has been a, a real issue News now in, in terms of attainment levels in this country. And it's been that way for a while, and yeah. we're seeing it happen in America as well. Um, and I think that having a conversation where you're almost saying um, um, that if you're tackling one, you're somehow taking away from the other, I don't think is the conversation to have. I think the conversation is we have to ensure we're doing whatever it takes to make sure that all underrepresented groups are succeeding in society. That said, you cannot in any way um, then move to the position that racism doesn't exist in the way that you can't move to the position that classism doesn't exist, which is what this is. And both need different approaches to be tackled. And so for me, um, the conversation that I think is really important to have is to really take a sort of detailed, granular look at what's gone wrong and what's gone wrong for all the various groups and what solutions are needed for that specific group. And I think that, that that is where you then begin to have progress because we don't want to leave anyone behind. So, yeah. Great. Did you have another question as well? Because you said you had several. Go. Yeah, you're, yeah, you're yeah. our co-host. Go, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, my next question is, so the, under diversity, it's very, it benefits, you know, the rich and the powerful. And I'm wondering how do we go about in, you know, turning that upside down in making diversity something that benefits, something that everybody sees as a benefit rather than, you know, us, you know, people changing the way the company works and stuff like that. Yeah. How do you make a benefit for, um, yeah, everybody seeing that yeah. is a good thing. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the thing is, a lack of inclusion Yes, it benefits the rich and the powerful, but only for so long. Because you can only sustain extreme levels of inequality for up to a period of time before the system cracks. You know, we see that in um, dictatorships. We see, we see it. It doesn't work. So actually, bigger picture, it's smarter to be more inclusive. And, and if you look at what most people want, most people don't want to be billionaires mm. anyway. Most people just want to be able to have a secure enough job that provides a good home and a good future for their children, a couple nice holidays a year. You know what I mean? Like if you talk to most people, they're not sitting there thinking, I want to be with Bill Gates. <laughs> you know, the, the hassle it takes to get to there, not many people want to do that. You know, you want to enjoy life as well. So actually, what we're looking at is doable. And I think that what it also means is that the children of those that we unleash and unleash the potential in, those children can actually truly fulfill their potential because they won't have the same barriers that have been in place up until now. 
So to me, I think for anybody who's incredibly wealthy and incredibly successful um, and wants to remain so and wants it to perhaps also apply for their kids, should be thinking bigger picture. Mm. Go on then. <laughs> uh, it's very short. Do you think um, black people like yourself and myself, do we have a responsibility to speak about diversity or um, is it enough for us to just sit back and see what everybody else does? Well, I think it's about what you're comfortable with. So I would never put a title on and say all oh, black people should do whatever. I think there's been too much of that, hasn't there? Where we're expected too often to address issues that we didn't necessarily create. Um, so I think it's whatever somebody's comfortable with. With me, I've always been comfortable doing that. Um, but if it doesn't apply for someone else, that's fine too. You know, everybody has their role to play. You know, now I'm not particularly vocal on social media about issues. That's not the role I'm playing right now. The role I'm playing right now, I hope, is, is you know, trying to, you know, create opportunity. Um, so I think it, when everybody knows what their role is in creating change, and that's those that are from underrepresented groups as well as allies, um, it, just, it just makes things much clearer. And, and then we all have a sort of goal that we're heading towards. So, yeah. Wonderful. Thank you, Thank you. Very good. Great questions. Arkham, would you like to... Take the mic. I don't think my questions are going to be as good as yours. <laughs> oh, <I'm gonna> <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> I, um, I think, firstly, for me, I mean, it's not really a question. It's more just about kind of it resonated when you said, I was just looking at my notes here, you don't have the luxury of being mediocre. No. And that really resonated, and I think, with things that I've read. So I you know, identify as a gay man yes. and non-white. Yes. And I think I've done a lot of reading, probably more about kind of growing up as, as you know, a gay child rather yes. than... Um, as, as a non-white person, yeah. that in itself probably kind of speaks mm. volumes. Um, and I think there's a lot of studies out there, aren't there, that kind of do say that you, you strive more because you feel like you have to prove yourself, whether it's in the workplace, oh, you whether do. it's in your family, whether it's to your <laughs> parents. Yeah. They'd say, I'm good enough. Yeah. I, I'm as good as my straight siblings. Yeah. So I think the idea of the, you know, mediocre is, is not okay. Yeah. It's a really interesting one. I think the other thing that I, f I think is interesting, though, is around unpicking the idea of is it an internal thing or is it an external thing mm. um and i think I it's think probably it's a both. bit of both right it's both. It's yeah it's yes. both and it's, it's both. how you because i think a lot of diversity and inclusion can be really focused on what we do with the external factors so what do we do as businesses what do we do as employers what do we do as schools but actually there is that thing of how do you deal with someone who's grown up with that yeah the psychological impact psychological yeah. impact yeah. imposter syndrome yeah. yeah you've grown up with and then suddenly everyone's saying you're cool as you are you're like yeah, yeah but you're inside like, yeah. I've got 40 years worth of internal yeah. voice yeah. telling yeah. me I'm not yeah. so yeah. it's how you are sensitive of that and I'm, I'm really conscious of that as, as a leader in our business and as an uncle and you know as a friend I'm really conscious of how you are aware of that and yeah. what do I do to make it okay yes. for my teams, for, for me even, yeah. for the clients we work with, what is it that we do to help balance that it is the external thing but it's also being aware that someone has got this internal monologue going on or they have had for a really long time. Well, I think that's so important and I'm so glad that you've brought that up because that is the bit that gets overlooked, isn't it? That's the bit that isn't addressed and it's both ways. It's the internal dialogue, but it's also the superior mindset of those that fit the mold of belonging. And, and so you're having to change the minds of both groups. You're having to change the minds of those that are from the minority who subconsciously on some level will feel inferior. It's impossible not to. In, in, in the world that's been created. Do you see what I mean? And then if you are from a more elite background, on some level you will feel superior. It's very hard not to. So actually what we're now doing is we're trying to bring these two groups together to say that, one, be aware of it, because often you're not even aware of it. This stuff is just playing out and we're just, you know, you're in a meeting and somebody stands up, in a white man stands up in a suit and says, right, we're doing this. <laughs> you know, mm. someone else who isn't that stands up and like, who do they think they are? Do you see what I mean? And you're not even knowing why you're responding in that way, but it's because of the way we've all been conditioned. 
So I think what I love about your point is one, just acknowledging it, mm -hmm. that it's there, it exists. And then I think it's good to be able to go back and pinpoint where were the times in your life where that stuff was imprinted on you? Because then you can start undoing it. You know, I was at school and my teacher made me feel like I was stupid because or said people like you can't be what, whatever it is. Mm. And I think that those are the moments to unpick for those that are from um, the minority. And then for the majority is even the fact that you've never had to question it because everything around you has said that, yes, you, yes, you, you're the one that's supposed to lead. And so there is a lot of undoing and unpacking to be done. And, and I think it's really exciting. But we have to admit it's there. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and I like your idea of creating the, the safe spaces yes. to do that. So yes. in, in our organization, we have something called Tea and Talk. Nice. Grab a cup of tea. Yeah. And we do it kind of once every few weeks. Lovely. And it's a safe space to talk about whatever's going on in the world. So yes. Whether it's Black Lives Matter, whether it's um, kind of women's equality, yep. you know, it's Pride Month, yep. whatever's going on, mm. and to create a really safe space for people just to talk. Yeah. And share what they're feeling. Yeah. No judgment, and we're there for each other yeah. to, to, to talk about it. And I think understanding the lived experiences, because mm. you know you've 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 touched on on being a gay man. I think one of the things that straight people don't consider enough is what that is like to have to come out you, mm. in that when you are it's hideous by the way yeah, yeah right and also don't forget you don't just do it once you then have to do it again and again people haven't yeah. seen you in 10 years yeah. you've got to come out do you see what i mean it's like and i think that people don't understand the burden and if and again if you are a person of color and the, 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 or, and, and, and again, varying degrees. And we know that racism and how it impacts black people is different to how it impacts Asian people, et cetera, et cetera. And the, the burden of that. And I think that when we start having these conversations and we understand each other's lived experience, even disability, when no one, if you are a wheelchair user, so many things we will all be close to that actually if you're somebody that has a mobility issue of any kind, you have to go through again and again and again. And what that does and how exhausting that is before you even get to do your actual job. Mm. And I think that when we start having these conversations in a real way, then you're like, oh, my colleague is dealing with that too. Okay. And they're still delivering on time. Wow. How amazing are they? And I think, yeah, it's important. Wonderful questions. Mm. Yeah, right. really good. We love you. co-hosts. Turn the cameras around. You can ask us a yeah. little questions. Uh, <laughs> Katrina, did you have a question as well? You want to ask? Okay, we'll keep right. Let's yeah, keep going. Keep going. I wanted to take a question from the from our our audience. virtual our audience virtual audience. Well. Love There's it. Lots of people who've tuned in live. Hi everyone. This is from Natalie, and it's going to lead into the next question I wanted to ask you as yeah, well about your role at the BBC. But she she asks um. How much has TV changed since your days of oh. being on Channel 4? Yeah. And how do you feel about that? And what yeah. Was, what well, I think it's changed a lot, but not enough. Right. So, you know, when I was starting, I, I was probably the only one like me. Obviously, there'd been the presenters before who I looked up to, like Floella Benjamin and you know, yeah. Moira Stewart and people like that. Um, but I suppose it wasn't anyone doing the kind of youth telly that I was doing, because in itself it was quite a new thing. Yeah, it was, yeah. Um, and so there weren't any... I, did, I hardly ever worked with crew that was diverse when I was in the 20 years of telly. Hardly. Yeah. Count on one hand. Um, and I think the thing that's different now is that there is a concerted effort being made to address that. But I still think there's probably not enough talent um, that, are, that have the big name recognition of their white equivalents, because that's really what you want, isn't yeah. it? You know, yeah. So there's lots at a certain level where you might kind of recognize their face, sort of, but you don't really know who they are in the way that you would know some of the others. And I think that what we also now need are some sort of big stars um, in the way that we've had in acting. I think we need that in presenting as well. Right. Mm. Well, let's look at that and your yeah. role at the BBC because yeah. 
I'd like to know like, how that came about, and yeah. um, I know that I'd like to discuss a little bit more about the remit. And what yeah. it, because, of course, we're not just talking here about, we're talking about diversity in its broadest sense. And like oh, you yeah, said, of course. neurodiversity, yeah. we've got disability, we've got all the things that we... Class, yeah, and, yeah. and Class, yeah. yeah. And see, even I say class. I class. Can't, I say, I'm from the north. Yeah. Class. Accent yeah. could be one as well we can think about. Yeah. Um, because I think it's quite a common misconception when we talk about diversity and inclusion. I think a lot yeah. of people think, well, it's just those the immediate things that come to mind. But yeah, like you were saying yeah, people's experiences are very, very different. Very different. And, and and we have to all of that be mindful important. of that. Yeah. So, so tell us about what you're doing. What well, you can tell us. Yeah, of course. Um, so um, I've been in the role now for a year and a half, um, and it sort of all came about in a very um, unplanned way. Um, so. I'd written Diversify, and um, and and a lot of it was never the intention, but it just kind of happened that way. It sort of became a DNI tool, and so a lot of HRs and DNIs started reading my book and using my book um, as their sort of um, manual uh, for the diversity and inclusion. Um, and so I started working with a lot of companies and a lot of organisations. Um, around this uh, area and really helping them with their DNI agendas. And then um, the BBC approached me to say that there was this position and would I be interested uh, in applying. And at first I was like, well, actually, not really, because I was really enjoying what I was doing and I, I wasn't looking for a permanent role. And also my experience with my industry was that it wasn't necessarily an industry that was as inclusive as it thought it was. Mm. So I was like, well, you know, unless they're serious, then I'm not the person for the job. Yeah. And at the time, um, Tony Hall, um, Charlotte Moore, uh, who I adore, um, Bob Shannon, who's amazing, who's my direct boss, were both, were all very clear with me that this was something that they really were focused on and they were going to give it the seniority that it deserved, but also the support it deserved from across the whole of the executive committee. Um, and, and that was a reassurance that I needed and they've stuck to their word. And obviously now with, with Tim as leader, mm, yeah. um, he's brilliant on this issue and, and has been very clear that it's also gonna be attached to how leaders are assessed in the business. So yeah, it's, it's, it's great. And it's always important when you're, when you're a leader and you're leading something like that to get some quick wins in early you like, have what, to what are, yeah. the, what are the because also if, if, if you're doing it as well and you're doing it in a big corporate like that yeah. imagine you know other people trying to do it in their business what are the quick wins that you've had so far and yeah one of our quick wins was <clears throat> when i joined it was before the actual hr person so my role is not hr my role is only creative yeah so i work with our commissioners and suppliers for really helping to create the dni uh, strategy and agenda for the output, but news doesn't come under me. Right. So it's it's content. Yes. And um, and um, so when I joined, the HR person hadn't yet started, and it was off the back of um, the Naga Manchetti um, uh, episode. So basically, there was a lot of frustration and tension within the organisation because that was still very fresh, mm. um, and so. What I noticed um, looking at the sort of leadership committees is that there were a lot of committees that didn't have any diverse talent. And actually, we worked with one of the, um, the um, groups, um, uh, our sort of internal groups, and, and they came up with a, s a set of recommendations. And then we worked with our um, exec committee, and we all agreed that there would be a diverse advisor program created whereby no decision-making body in the BBC would be without at least two diverse advisors. Oh. And what that did was that also then helped to create almost like a cohort of talent that could be developed for future leadership roles. So that was a quick win. Oh, a um, and it just sent a message. It really, I felt, it helped to sort of diffuse some of the tension that was there because it was a meaningful gesture um, that, that, that showed that the organisation meant business on this issue. Mm. Still a long way to go, but it was a start. And then Anne Foster, who's head of HR, who's done some fantastic work, 
has really brought in um, Tim's 50-20-12 agenda, which is 50% uh, gender equality, 20% BAME, uh, and 12% disability. Excellent. Mm. Well, it's always good as well to have a bit of a rallying cry like that as well, yeah. with clear numbers to yeah. go after. And totally. Um, we, always, we always ask this question of all our guests. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and it's about unblocking, because what, what I like to do is like, think about what would success look like yeah. for you. So I'm going to ask you the question. If you were to wake up in the morning, one morning, yeah. <laughs> and it, you were looking at it, and everything was how you wanted it from the work that you're trying to do now, it was all happening brilliantly. What would that look like? What would, what would you have achieved? What does success look like for you in the future of diversity and the work you're doing? I think success really looks like anybody um, who has something to offer, um, having the opportunity to offer it, isn't it? Pretty simple. Simple yeah. as that. <laughs> you know, when you think of how much untapped potential there is, how much human waste goes on in our society. Mm. Madness. So I think that that's success. Oh, I really, I, lo I, I love the simplicity of that because you're right, we can get wrapped up as humans about, I mean, we do, I mean, climate change, I mean, and, and, and Which, or everything course, around must. us. Yeah, yeah we are, absolutely. But, uh, but, but we forget about the, uh, the human waste. Yeah, the human waste. The stuff I mean, yeah, there's a lot of, you know, physical waste, of course, we know that. But there's a, a but actually the human waste is probably really the, the root cause of m much of the issues that we have in society because there's a lack of balance. When you have those diverse perspectives in the room, it creates balance. You know, if you look at things like the sort of financial crisis and all those issues that we've had, I, I wonder how different the outcome may have been if you had people who actually had families yeah. who were impacted by some of these decisions. Yeah. And so, yeah. I, um, I know that you're also involved across the industry in other things. So you, mm. You're working... Obviously, you work, we, we're on the board of the Yes, BBC, which you and I are on the board of the British Fashion Council. Uh, I think you're working with a couple of other people. I know Ete and Julie, and I think with Brim. Yeah, doing that as they're well. They're great. And uh, you're obviously working across all these different things. But what are all you? All creative industries. All creative industries. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, what do you think, though, is is at the heart of blocking what we want to see happen? Happen? Like, what are the conversations or the things that you're hearing from? the organisations, the people themselves, what, what is happening? I think at the heart of it is probably a mistrust in the ability of diverse talent. There's a sort of infantilization that happens. Right. So I, a resistance to giving people from diverse backgrounds real authority, real power, real sort of decision-making roles, because at the back of that is a, is a sort of mistrust in whether or not they can, because we haven't seen enough of it. And, and so I think that's perhaps one of the biggest things we have to address in, in making sure that the talent does progress. Wow. Mm. I don't actually... I, I do see... The but you know what I mean, I know exactly what, yeah. You know what I mean, yeah. Someone's like, yeah, can we trust yes. you enough to deliver all and of it's this? It's not said, it's never directly said like that. It's no, more, it's oh, not. Oh, well, yeah. are they ready? Yes. Yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. You've but done yes. really well this far. Yeah, but, next step yeah, <laughs> but whereas somebody else who has not yet proven... Yeah, yeah. You, you know yeah. what I mean? And so this is, this is the thing we have to really look at. Uh, Chantelle, from our audience again, virtual audience. Hi, Chantelle. Uh, she said, because again, we're thinking about the blockers and you know what's what's causing that. But she yeah. said it's difficult being an ethnic minority employee within a workplace where equality and diversity actions take place as a checkbox procedure. Hmm. How do we make sure that, that isn't a blocker? Well, in terms of checkboxes, you know they're not ideal, hmm. but got to start somewhere, haven't you? And I think that sometimes we get caught up in, am I just being hired because, or is it tokenistic? And, and yes, we don't want, you know, tokenism, of course not. But I also have to think we have to be mindful of the other side of that, which is 
where more often than not, you haven't been given jobs because of the color of your skin. Yeah, yeah. So we have to readdress the balance. And no way am I saying we give people jobs because of the color of their skin. No. Of course not. But what we do is we, we, we acknowledge that we haven't had a level playing field and we somehow have to find ways to level that playing field. Yes, yeah, sometimes when I hear the word checklist, what goes in my mm. mind is actually, is actually just transparency and consistency. Yeah. So just help me know what we're all being judged on so yeah. that we can all do the right thing and, yeah. and, and there's no surprise if I yeah. don't make it or if I do make it yeah. because I know what we're getting judged on. Totally. Um, there's another blocker that, someone, that actually Malik's brought up, which I think is very real and for a lot of the businesses that we're in with. But uh, Malik says, what are your thoughts on cancel culture? And do you think people who have tweeted racist things in the past should be sacked or given a second chance? Wow. Well, I do think that we have to look at the fact that we are not allowing room for redemption. Mm. And we're not allowing room for growth and people changing. Yeah. I know I'm a very different person now to what I was at 15, 16. Yeah, likewise, yeah. Really? Yeah. And, and so I think that I understand why council culture or whatever was created, you know, to call out some of these sort of injustices. But the problem is we're not looking at what it is that we're trying to create which is a fairer society, which means that you want people who have not looked at the world in an inclusive way to change the way that they think. Yeah. And there are a lot of people who perhaps thought one thing 10 years ago that thinks something very different now. Yeah. And, and we're not making any um, room for acknowledging that yeah. and actually celebrating that so that that's more of what happens i think when we're only focused and look when it's extreme stuff you know whatever i get it but what i'm just saying is that when we're only focused about what someone has done and not who they are now yes is that who we want to be it's really interesting because in a lot of other things like that you would you would talk about meaningful progress like you'd say we started here and now we're here. And um, isn't that the example of what we want? Yeah, yeah. We you... want more people to, yeah. have, to have changed their mind on some of these issues. Yeah. So and actually, a lot of the people who do, I mean, you know, like I say, you can't, you can't, we're not here to sort of say, well, that's right and that's wrong. But quite often what is said, they are high-profile people who then actually say, look, you know, I'm, I'm, but I'm also, often, sometimes, they are completely have demonstrated that they are somebody different now. Yeah, Do you yeah, see what I mean? Yeah. So, well, actually, if you flipped what they're doing and then you enable them to say what they say now, they'd have a, a big influence and a big following anyway. And people go, yeah, actually, I'm with you. Yeah, rather than them I getting cancelled. To, I think we need to find a balance. I don't think we've got it yet. No, I, no. I, I agree. I agree. But I think that's part of the learning, right? It's like the pendulum swings from... Say what you want, do what you want, and then actually, no, we, and, and then we find something in the, middle, <laughs> in the middle. But it also takes the mindset of the, of the world, as it were, and, and how we think about yeah. being diverse and inclusive in and how all that and works. And think of what, it, what is it that's worth destroying a life over? That's yeah, the other yeah, thing, you yeah, know? Yeah, that's true. The, the reactions are so extreme a, lo a lot of the time. So, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, social media has had a fairly well influential in many positive ways but also in the last especially the focus on football and you know racist comments to footballers and everything else and to all sorts of people it's had a bit of a uh, very bad press lately mm. but i actually think that there's some good that can be that can yeah, come out of it I when it's used yeah, in I the right think way we need to make room for redemption we need to be open to the fact that people can change and more often than not they do well you also say, it's another thing that I, I love from your quotes, but you're a better listener than a talker, which is something you said. Yeah. Um, and I how do you... Too. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm going to say, yeah, but it's kind of you, you, your... Yeah. Part of your role and your job is to talk a lot, but actually if you, you do that really well. So if you listen as well as that, that's even better. Um, how does that help you? And how can like, being a better listener as well help people unlock these new perspectives and kind of make the changes that they need to see 
And how's it how's it helped for you? How's it helped you think differently about some yeah, stuff? Yeah, well, I think being a better listener than talker helps you to sort of build empathy with people, yeah. um, and therefore people feel comfortable around you to to share their truth. Because that's the other thing as well is also providing a judgment free zone for people to express their truth even if you don't agree with it mm. you know, again that's the only way we sort of move it's the only way we find common ground obviously extremes obviously not but I do think that again we're getting to a place where we're not even comfortable with people who think differently to us mm. and I think we have to somehow find a way to be okay with that too it's one of my, when I, when I do leadership stuff with people, it's one of the f things that I often flip on its head. You know when you go into a room and everyone's like, oh, you want to find out what your similarities are because then everyone feels really comfortable that we're this one big homogenous group. You ask people to go and find out what, what your differences are. What are the things that you really don't have the same opinion on? And it's such a rich And experience. that you can still enjoy the person. Exactly. Based on lots of other things. Exactly. Yeah. You actually end up enjoying them for their passion on yeah. the, the thing that you've got an opposite view on. But also, it opens your minds to a different perspective oh, that you really? hadn't even thought about previously before. Um, who's doing it really well, June, in your book? Who's inspiring you and taking this? Well... What you're to do? Who's doing it really well and taking it forward? Well, I think that... Um, you know, I've been doing some work with Burberry, and I have to say I'm so impressed really? by what I'm seeing. My goodness. Um, what are they doing that's impressing you, that you can share? Just, just um, how, one, holistic the approach is. It's a 360 approach. And, and what I'm loving, um, what I'm seeing um, Erica, um, who is the head of HR, doing there is it's not just as a problem. They've really identified the cause and causes of the problem. And that's what they are addressing. And I yeah. think that's what we don't see enough of. Mm. Often we, we problem, solution. Yeah. Or not even, what, not even solving the problem that's the real problem. But yes. It's just we like doing a bit of stuff. We haven't looked at what's causing this yeah, in the yeah, first yeah. place. Yeah. And I, I know that I've just been so blown away by it. And just also the sort of granular detail that's gone into the strategy that they're planning. I mean, it's a long-term strategy, but I'm, I must say, you know, I'm lucky I get to see a lot of organizations and the work that they're doing in this space, and this is some of the best I've seen. And, and, and again, I haven't seen anybody who's really addressing race and is comfortable addressing race and I, I believe that actually that's the toughest one and, and whoever gets that right that becomes a gold standard because yeah. for, for every because it once you crack the hardest yeah it makes it so much easier to deal with the rest you yeah. see what I mean and yeah. so seeing companies or leaders that are now trying to be culturally um, confident and by culturally, I don't just mean sort of workplace culture. I mean ethnic culture too. Is 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 yeah. Uh, that that I want to see more of. And and like I say, I have to say what I'm seeing. It's early stages, but it's it's impressive. Excellent. Well, good job for good job for that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Keep close to that. And find mm. out what else happens on that. Mm -hmm. um, you said it breaks your heart when people go to their grave without realizing their potential. Can you imagine? <laughs> it's just, I know, it's, it's, it does the same It does, well. right? <laughs> Absolutely really breaks, to cry. breaks it, my it heart. Just, it's like really bad, isn't it? Uh, who, who unlocked your potential? Who, do you, who would you A credit with lots helping of, you? Lots of people. I know um, Trevor Nelson was one. Yeah, I love Trevor. <laughs> Good old Trev. Yeah, Trev, Trev really helped me get my first MTV job. He, yeah. He's awesome. Yeah. Um, Lots and lots of people. Um, obviously, uh, my parents. Um, you know, like I said, I'm from a Ghanaian background, and the Ghanaian culture is very matriarchal. Yeah. And um, so women in our culture are very outspoken. And so being curious and um, vocal 
was welcomed in my family and in my household and in my community. So I never knew a girl wasn't supposed to have an opinion <laughs> until you know, I got out into the wider world because yeah. all the women I knew had lots of opinions. And so I think that that was, a, again, a really, really, really great grounding. Um, and then I was lucky enough to go to a, a fabulous girls' school, even though I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm much more in, in favour of, of mixed gender schools because I think we have to prepare people for the world mm -hmm. and the world that they're going to be in. Still, going to an all girls' school was very good for me, um, and I had these amazing feminist teachers. Um, who just nurtured us and, and made us believe we could do anything, you know? And I think that that was incredible. Um, and then obviously work experience at KISS FM and, and the, there was a wonderful woman there called Myrna McHugh who was the person who basically got me back again and again to do work experience there. Um, and then the same with um, Trevor and lots of people. And then people who now help me now it never ends does it no. like it's never ending there's always someone who's opening the next door um yeah what keeps you motivated and driven to on this i mission that I, I think just i like people you know and I, I like people i find people fascinating and the idea of if anything that i can do can help someone do a bit more then why wouldn't i yeah <laughs> Isn't it? So I, I, I'm genuinely, you know, because quite often when I speak to people who've got, you know, such like, big visions like you have and mm. want to achieve these things, they can do it, they can talk about it in quite a complex, complicated way. <laughs> what I love is, <laughs> well, I, but I'm really simple. I mean, I yeah. just, to everyone, I'm a really simple guy. I mean, I just I'm try and say things in I'm three a words. I'm a girl. We tell uh, it like it is. But I just love the simplicity <laughs> of, like, what success looks like for you, what really makes you sad. And yeah, what, you know, like you, you said, it gets you teary when you think people. Yeah, and I think that Gosh, I think that, that I, simplicity is really powerful in these kind of yeah. these kind of things because mm -hmm. that you you don't have to think through a whole load of filters. It's like either <laughs> is somebody getting the best out of this or yeah. not? Right, can I help them? Yes or no? Totally. You know, there's like a, there's you know good examples of that. So in Malcolm Gladwell's Outlier, Outliers, he talks about. This incredible, he looked at all of the kids born of, at a certain year who had like crazy high IQs and whether or not their ability uh, was impacted by their social circumstances. And so he went, you know, found these kids and there were the ones that came from some more privileged backgrounds that gone on to do incredible things. And there's one story in particular that sort of stuck out to me, this genius kid from the inner city or no he wasn't from the inner city he was from sort of Appalachia or somewhere like that um, this genius kid environment just wasn't supportive of of that level of academic brilliance and he didn't get the sort of the interventions that would sometimes happen for a kid a gifted kid like that where you get the scholarship to the private school and blah, blah. none of that happened for him oh. And um, he was working as a bouncer. Oh. And not that there's anything wrong with yeah, that. But, but with all of the sort of complex issues that we have to solve in society, there is a mind that could have been utilized absolutely. for something else. But absolutely. just circumstances just meant that those opportunities would not find him. And I think that that's tragic. Mm. And, you know, there's another story that I read when I was um, researching Diversify. Um, of a, a charity that was working with people um, on the autism spectrum. And the, the charity had um, w found like some really great talent and then they started working with tech companies to sort of get this, th these um, talented individuals jobs. And so one of the people that was on the program had done so well that he was like now I don't know, head of cyber security at some big tech firm. And a few years earlier, he'd been flipping burgers in, in a fast food restaurant. Again, nothing wrong with that. But because of his inability to interact socially mm. and his sort of lack of social skills, it meant that he couldn't get a 
normal job because he couldn't go through the interview process. Yeah. So this charity's intervention, and now, you know, he's thriving in this amazing position. So think who he could have been or who he would have been had that charity not intervened. Do you know, I mean, it's, it's fascinating. Oh, we, we are, we are up. close to time up. Look at that. We are literally time up. Yeah. We, we carry on for one last second to say our <laughs> properly our farewells. It's a sad, so that we can carry on for a little bit on the audience. I wanted to ask you just two final qu yeah, uh, questions, please. June, before we do, because I really, the, the audience love to know a little yeah. bit more about the things that you're doing. Um, but tell us, what are the book, what, give us one book that you're reading at the moment. Uh, one book that I'm reading at the moment, I don't think I've just been sent it, actually, um, so I'm going to start reading it, um, is uh, Emma Barnett's Period. Oh. <laughs> every, every man should read this book, too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get that now to read. Yeah, you father will, of will, girls. Will, you father really of two girls, actually. Yeah. Yeah, I will definitely mm -hmm. read that. Um, oh, my book. How of Women oh, is out tomorrow. Exactly. Well, this yeah. is what we... Uh, I write about periods in that, too. <laughs> So actually, no offence to Emma, get my one. Yes, yeah. That's that, got that, periods in is, there too. Is, yeah. <laughs> Quickly tell us, tomorrow, tomorrow's book launch, tomorrow is the yeah, Power is, of Women book yeah. launch. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about the book. Yeah, you know. Power of Women, why gender equality is good for everyone. It's a little pocket guide, so it's a quick read. Um, and it really talks about what happens when we unlock the potential of women and how that actually is also beneficial for everybody in society, including men. And that female emancipation does not have to mean male emasculation. Um, and so, yeah, it's... Um, oh, I've got a little clap yeah. there. Thank you. Fantastic, ooh, yeah. <laughs> you got a word. <laughs> <laughs> oh. uh, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, June, thank you so much thank i mean there's so much oh, from today's God. session so some much incredible questions from the audience some great insights as ever and june's book is out tomorrow yeah power of women it's a small and all june's books are brilliantly practical and inside, but it's okay we'll, i'll yeah. get one soon we'll no see, see you again soon um we, we'll produce the boom sheet from this session as well so you'll have all these great insights all this thinking some great stuff from June today, and uh, you'll be able to watch this recorded version as well on our Fora YouTube site too. Thank you all for joining us once again. We've got more guests coming through the year, and as we start to open up, the summer starts to come up, we'll invite more people into the studio here at Fora to join us for our Boom Time show. Thank you all, and until next time, stay boom. Stay boom.